So our guest today here on the Four Doctors Forum here at Concierge Medicine Today and the Docpreneur Leadership Podcast and Broadcast is Dr. Christopher Liu. He is an MD and a PhD, and we're going to talk to him in a three-part series. This is the first part. We're going to talk to him first today about the transitioning of... Um, transitioning your physician medical career into something other than clinical practice. How does a physician who's kind of burned out, maybe just, this just isn't for me. I think I want to keep my medical degree. Or maybe I want to stay a little bit with one foot in the clinical area, but I have interests. I have these inclinations, uh, these, these entrepreneurial ideas that I want to do something else I have expertise that I think lends itself better in other areas, but I still want to keep uh, my, my, my one foot in the door of clinical practice. So Dr. Christopher Liu, thank you for joining us today. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me. Good morning, and thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So you are from Houston, Texas. So before we jump into the topic today, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, who, wh why you have two degrees, because that's a, a feat in itself, as uh, many of our listeners and physicians and uh, listeners and watchers know. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about uh, what drew you into medicine, first of all, and then what drew you into the other areas of expertise found in your studies. Yeah, definitely. So, um, well, I grew up um, on the cusp of um, Gen X and millennials. And, uh, you know, from an early age, I've always been an entrepreneur. So uh, since the age of 11, I've honed that instinct into a skill set ever since. Um, nevertheless, you know, back in the, uh, when I was growing up, it was standard practice for um, one to pursue a profession such as medicine, law, business or finance, because that led to the stable job, lifestyle, family, etc. So uh, I followed that path for a long time. Uh, my main motivation for going into medicine was because my mom passed away due to breast cancer when I was 11 years old. So that had a significant impact on mm -hmm. me growing up, uh, you know, I had to really fend for myself. And a lot of times, I use that entrepreneurial instinct as a means of survival. So um, I went to Rice, I went to, got into Baylor for medical school, was part of the MD PhD program. And the impetus for uh, the MD PhD was to take clinical questions and ideas and bring them into the lab so that you could develop solutions, either new diagnoses, therapies, uh, novel ways of interacting and treating with patients so that you could make an impact on the healthcare system. As we all know, the healthcare system today is quite bureaucratic, quite broken, highly regulated. So, you know, in theory, an MD PhD helps, but in practice, usually physicians go into either clinical practice or they do basic science research. So go ahead. No, I was just uh, continue with your with your thoughts. I'm I'm just processing. You know, a lot of doctors, mm -hmm. especially you know young physicians in their 30s and early 40s, have. You know, I I do see more entrepreneurial concepts and and ideas flowing out of them, uh, mm -hmm. but the idea of if I build it, they will come. Uh, you know, concept is. It flee it come it goes by pretty quick and it's a it's a hard learning curve for a lot of young physicians to learn. What's maybe some of your insights or advice that you've learned as a uh, with in working with younger physicians in that demographic that you know have these ideas but they think you know it's I'm gonna I'm gonna help people and obviously that's the heartbeat of every physician and healthcare provider you know, starting out, but then they quickly learn within a year or two, there's bureaucracy, there's reimbursements, there's promises broken, there's burnout. I didn't sign up for this. Uh, what's, what's some of your advice for the younger physicians out there who are kind of struggling with that? Yeah, it's a really complex and very um, difficult question because there's so many different factors. We have... Um, you know, at the heart of it is just the, the system is just completely broken. Uh, and it's really hard because I know uh, several startup companies try to address these insurance and 
issues, but uh, you know, a lot of them just end up uh, closing doors because they just, it's just so hard to get into. So my advice to younger generation is, well, one, I think it's, I wouldn't trade a second of my medical degree. I really, the, my time at Baylor and Rice were the best seven years of my life. It's just that if you, you come in with these idealized notions and you want to save or change the world, it's going to be very difficult because what the system wants you to do is just see patients, do procedures, uh, bill more, uh, do uh, diagnose and treat more. So they're not really asking you to uh, save the world or change the face of medicine. They just want you to fit in the system and work within it. So there's a couple ways. A lot of physicians, you can become an entrepreneurs, which means that you can innovate within an organization, within a company. Uh, a lot of people go into academia for this reason, because they can do a lot of research, clinical research. They can um, impact the institution. So that's one way is to become an entrepreneur. The other way is, like I said, I honed an entrepreneurial skill set since an early age. So what you can do is uh, you can do uh, various um, side projects based on your ideas. And these days, the barriers to entry to doing those types of projects are much lower and the potential reward is much higher. So that's another way. But like I said, it's, it's going, it's, um, you know, I wish I had known this going into medical school that, you know, we all come with these preconceived idealized notions and um but the reality is you know the reality is is a much different wow so let's move on to our next question which is who is leaving um and we'll we'll, we'll compartmentalize some of these these topics in 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 our questions who is leaving and then we already know why they're leaving that's that's a question that's been I mean, you don't have to go down a rabbit trail very long on a on a blog or on LinkedIn to to find out why doctors are frustrated. That's obvious. But who is leaving? And you know, break up some of those demographics for us. Is it is it a lot of male physicians? Is it a lot of female physicians? Is it younger? Um, and then is it just physicians, or do we also see nurse practitioners, PAs, RNs? We know that they're overworked as well. Mm. I think, uh, well, what I've seen, I've seen, for example, a lot of the um, uh, physicians from the baby boomer generation who really enjoyed a uh, fruitful medical career during the 90s and, you know, early part of 2000, a lot of them are starting to retire uh, just because, you know, they've, they've put in their time, uh, you know, a lot of them wish they could um, extend their careers. But, um, you know, I've, I've been on, I've been a consultant to several hospitals and I've seen, you know, um, just the frustration with the, um, the baby boomer generation with the um, electronic health records. So a lot of them just, you know, just are retiring, you know, rightfully so. That's one segment. The se this other segment that's quite alarming is the, um, the younger cohort the ones, the early career physicians, you know, a couple years out, two, five to 10 years out, those, that's the one where we're seeing um, uh, a lot of mass exodus. And, you know, that's concerning in a couple of respects, because first is that, um, you know, as our population increases in ages, we're going to need a significant number of physicians to help treat their chronic health issues, their acute health issues. Um, but the Sad fact is that, you know, there's a predicted physician shortage in the coming decade. So that's the quite alarming. In terms of male and female, I don't really think there's a predilection for one or the other. But what we're seeing is a lot of, we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of uh, inequality. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, mental health issues, a lot of uh, suicide as well. Um, and a lot of, and this has a a great effect and impact on physicians' families, such as divorce, um, you know, quality of life, and that sort of thing. Wow. Well, let's um, pivot over to to that topic uh, quickly and and talk a little bit about the inequality um, side of this. You know, the social media environment is, and in, in the last couple of years, uh, we see it kind of go in in, in spurts where. Uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, things happen last year w within the social media physician and healthcare provider community. 
um, where doctors were not supporting, you know, uh, a higher up doctor and doctors were showing their support. And I think, you know, there wasn't enough PPP and all these types of things. And, uh, you know, so what is being done in the uh, inequality within healthcare from, you know, is it starting on an academic level within medical institutions where we're starting to, you know, do something about it? Or is it something where medical associations are getting involved? Um, and how do doctors, I think that's another question too, how do healthcare providers of, of all different specialties and types, as well as physicians, how do they get involved to help with the inequality issues because I, I, I don't know if raise awareness because there's a lot of awareness about it already, but mm -hmm. what can they do? What are some handlebars that they can grab onto um, while they're in medicine, while they're exiting their, their career in medicine and trying something else, you know, being a, a superstar in your own backyard and making it, having your voice heard in a, your local backyard community is, is a great handle. What's your, some of your, the things that you're seeing out there as you work with doctors and others? Well, I, I see a lot of, um, like you said, a lot of awareness about the issue and um, there's no one great solution, but a lot of times, so a lot of um, during the COVID pandemic, when um, there was a lot of studies done, a lot of um, grassroots awareness, um, a lot of uh, publications in medical journals about various issues. So, you know, one of the biggest issues from last year was just the inequality in terms of um, the hospitals and institutions needing providers, but they had, they didn't have the resources to either pay them or protect them, you know, for, you know, in terms of the PPE. So in a lot of this, you know, a lot of this um, early on, for example, when physicians and nurses spoke up, um, you know, it, it made national news when, you know, they were, their contracts were terminated for speaking up against the system. I think uh, the backlash was that, um, you know, a lot of the, um, the legal side got involved. So once the legal side gets involved, then hospitals are, um, are bound to, to change. And, and what's going to happen is new rules, regulations, bureaucracies, more additional uh, paperwork, red tape, and that sort of thing gets introduced. So that's, that's one thing, but like I said, it's, it's um, a lot of physicians are starting to speak up against this. Uh, a lot of, if you go on the social media, um, that's why in terms of my own practice, what I, what I advocate is having uh, backup streams of income so that, you know, you know, in case your clinical income gets reduced or you get furloughed or replaced or whatever, it has no effect or bearing on your quality of life because you have investments from, real estate or stocks, you know, or different businesses and that sort of thing. So a lot of physicians are starting to heed the wake up call and starting to take action. You know, ultimately we, you know, call, you know, the medical associations, the licensing boards, you know, politicians, that sort of thing. But like I said, all of it, the, uh, you know, the whole political and institutional bureaucracy process takes, uh, you know, sometimes years to, to, to make a change. It is a Titanic feat, and it, yeah, it's, it's exactly <laughs> steering the Titanic, right? Exactly. So, uh, so let's talk a bit about what you do with specificity, and you know, let's talk about what the options are for transitioning out of medicine. But again, you know, I have talked with a number of doctors over the years, and it's hey. The, the, I remember one, one doc, he said, I work really hard for this and it took me a long time. So yeah, I'm like 70, I'm in my mid seventies and I'm not letting go of my medical degree just yet, you know? So they continue uh -huh. to take the re, re up, you know, the, the exams and so on to, to keep up um, because they, they don't want to let it go. They might not practice in, inside of the exam rooms anymore, uh, but it is something that they, they cherish and that's great. Uh, because, you know, like we're seeing with the pandemic where states are coming back and saying, hey, we're going to relax some things, some, some rules so that you can come and help with the vac give vaccinations, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great that, you know, some of those who are have their medical degree but aren't practicing in clinical, um, you know, have some options out there. So what are those pathways, which, you know, if I'm at the fork in the road and it's got four prongs like a fork, um, what are some of those ways that I can earn additional income as a physician 
um, that are stable, that, you know, is what requires sweat equity? Uh, you know, there's no easy road as we know. There's no such thing as easy money like our dads and moms will always tell us. Uh, there's, uh, you know, for a, uh, for a physician, there's a number of different uh, pathways. So the, the beauty of a medical degree is that it gives you a brand and a platform to, to step on because you've already uh, qualified yourself in terms of um, academics integrity, um, helping others. So there's a, there's a plethora. So one thing that I recommend for physicians, the easiest way is, um, through consulting. So being a consultant and being a consultant is a very broad and general thing. So you could, you could work for Accenture, Deloitte, McKinsey, any of those big consulting companies. You can also be an independent consultant. So you can be, um, independent medical exam. You can do IMEs. You can be dis you can do disability insurance reviews. You can do file reviews. Um, the really the possibilities are endless because there are so many, uh, different niches in, in, in terms of, um, what's needed in the healthcare profession for physicians. Uh, you know, healthcare IT is a bargaining field um, with the electronic health record and now with um, data analytics, artificial intelligence, blockchain. Um, re you know, recently telemedicine is actually gain got, uh, gotten a lot of steam because with, you know, everything have to be virtual. So you can become a telemedicine virtual consultant as well. So I know a lot of physicians are taking on um, extra hours and extra uh, patients from their, from their home offices to, to supplement that income. Yeah. So like, you know, I, I host a monthly mastermind, you know, discussing the various ways of getting into consulting as well. Uh, other than that, you can be in, you can be an investor. So investing in um, equities, uh, real estate, commercial real estate, uh, syndicates as well. So there's a lot of physician investors that uh, take their, um, th who leverage their time and their money for more capital gains as well. So like I said, um, really being a physician brands you as an authority figure. Um, you can also do public speaking, you can do writing, you can create digital products, you can be a social media influencer, a niche influencer. So the possibilities are really endless. Wow. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about one of those, which is, you know, a, an interesting and I think intriguing one for a lot of physicians. And that is the real estate side of this, you know, they have that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but there's a, the lack of expertise, I think, is what's, you know, something that, like, in my area, you're in Houston, I'm in Atlanta, uh -huh. you know, if we were to talk with a physician in Florida, or, you know, Nebraska, I'd be like, well, I, I'm interested, you know, but how to, how much of this is going to require my time? What should I uh -huh. put my money into? Uh -huh. You know, should it be with a partner, another colleague? Because that could go south. You know, maybe we disagree. He wants to, she, he or she, you know, they want to pull out in a couple of years and then I'm left with the ticket. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you find expertise in this and, um, you know, uh -huh. what's, you, what's your role in that? Yeah. Um, well, I started real estate investing um, back in 99 and that's when they say that real estate is the best time to get in is, you know, when it's on the, the best day was yesterday. The best day is today. So, <laughs> and really I, I, I advocate for physicians to just start with a basic single family home, uh, you know, a starter home, you know, a fixer upper, nothing too expensive, nothing too risky and learn the ins and outs uh, from there. So there's, you know, with, owning and investing in a, in a single family, there's a lot of things, including property taxes, maintenance, expenses. Uh, you have to market for your tenants. You have to get it filled. You have to deal with the, you know, non-paying. You have to deal with liabilities, uh, insurance, and that sort of thing. So the best way is to get a starter home and then just from there, uh, learn the ins and outs. The, uh, with physicians in particular, because their time is so valuable and so limited, so one, one way is, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of physician spouses, so the spouse manages it. And so they, they work as a team. So a couple teams, once you have a good handle or, or grasp on real estate, so you can either scale up from there, you can continue. It's like a cookie cutter approach. You can 
purchase additional single family homes. You can scale up to, um, to multifamily or you can scale up to commercial or apartments. So that's going to take a little bit more capital and time. So in order to leverage that capital and time, you either partner up with, you either partner up with another uh, investor or you join a syndicate. So a syndicate is essentially a pool of investors uh, and it, there's a single sponsor that um, that uh, that pulls the, the 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 money together to invest in a larger deal. So that's a great way to leverage a physician's time and money. But the thing is, you don't just give your throw your money away to any sponsor. It, it takes a lot of skill in terms of vetting the sponsor, understanding the sponsor, you know, working relationship. Uh, you also have to have a good knowledge of how to invest in different types of more advanced properties, including apartments, multifamilies, and that sort of thing. So if a physician can get knowledgeable about what the potential risks are and, and they have a good working relationship with the sponsor, that's a great way to leverage their time and their money. So there's a lot of different ways to make money in real estate, um, you know, either through just, you know, sweat equity or through leveraging other people's uh, time, money, and efforts. And so uh, um, my next question is, is kind of statement uh, to prove and then your solution. Uh, so when we ask physicians over the years, you know, how many medical, how many in your medical degree, medical study, how many business courses did you take? How many credit hours did you get? Uh, the answer usually comes back as I took maybe two or three courses, maybe five uh -huh. credit hours out of hundreds of credit hours. Uh -huh. And then when we back that up, okay, we'll put a pin in it. Um, you know, where do you go to get business advice? Where do you go to get financial advice? Uh -huh. Oh, I go to I go to other clinicians, right? <laughs> and that's what that's what always the answer seems to be. And then you you combine those two, you know, post-it notes together, and you're like, so you do realize they got the same credit hours that you study you got. Uh -huh. It just might be that their life experience is eight years more than you, but it's not to say that their business or real estate or financial or consulting expertise is is any more better or worse than yours. Uh -huh. So where do you fit in? What advice do you have uh, for physicians where to go to learn about some of these things? Uh -huh. Where do they start? What, what and what, how can you help as well? Yeah. Well, the, the one book in, and it'll cost less than any course or coaching or whatever is uh, read the book, um, rich dad, poor dad. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's free now. You can probably find it for free. Um, and it's, and it'll tell it'll t it'll just basically open your eyes towards basic financial literacy. Um, it's the second book is to read is it's titled Multiple Streams of Income, and you know the the number one thing I got from that book it's about two hundred pages um, is to it's important it's important to have backup streams of income much like insurance in these days. Uh, so that if, you know, one source of income falls down, you have multiple um, uh, legs to, to sustain you. So, you know, my personal example, uh, I have 10 sources of income. And, you know, wow. last year, last year, um, with when the pandemic hit, it took out one entire source of income. But, you know, I was okay, because I had the other nine sources to, to, to back that up. So that's, that's the and that book is, you know, less than $10. You can and, and it'll it'll protect your financial future. It'll save your life. And um, the interesting thing is, I have never I've I've I sat in on some courses at uh, in the uh, MBA program at Rice when I was a graduate student because that was you know free and available to me, and that was great in terms of the networking and just in terms of the advanced concepts. But really, a lot of my education, uh, I've never you know, it's, it's fascinating to me. Financial literacy is not taught either in, you know, high school, college, or any level. So we have to, so we have to go in um, either self-experience or we have to get a coach or, you know, ask other people. Um, the beauty of it is that in today's age, you can go onto YouTube, you can go onto Spotify, 
um, any podcast and there, you know, you can get a great, um, a great gems of wisdom and just, you know, tons of experience. But I think it starts out with just, uh, you have to self-educate and, and invest in yourself. So, and that, that is, the, there's no course or anything that, you know, in the mainstream that will, that's going to teach you. It's, you know, it's up to us to get our own financial education. So. And what are some qualified places to go get that? Um, you know, we, yeah. we do know that as adults in our adult careers that people learn on a need to know basis. So yeah. we'll purchase a webinar, we'll buy a course, you know, yeah. we have a plentiful, uh, you know, virtual webinars, virtual courses that we can take mastermind groups, which you're talking, you can talk about as well. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, those are usually, you know, I was telling my son just the other day, you know, hey, son, life rule. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Yes. And, uh, you know, I was explaining that, you know, from a school lunch perspective, but also, you know, a learning perspective, making it a teachable moment uh, to say, you know, hey, when you get older, See, people are going to say, I'll buy, let me buy you lunch. And there's always, always, unless it's usually grandma or grandpa or mom and dad taking you out for lunch, uh -huh. there's usually a, a reason for it. So what do you, what are some of your resources for that? And you're welcome to, to list off links or, and please tell us how doctors can get connected with you. Cause you know, 10 sources of income, only losing one in a pandemic. That is pretty darn good. Yeah. It, the, in uh, in the reason why was because you know back in 2000 I started this you know you know pre 2000 it was it was great for everybody it was almost like the the best times you know nothing bad could happen but you know after 2000 you know you started to see you know 9 11 and then 2008 and you know all these different you know crises so that's so I really started to 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 really prepare from you know the future in terms of just livelihood and viability so i mean you can you can email me at uh, christopher lou md phd for any sources of um you know advice um you know my link tree i'm on link tree at dr chris lou md phd and you can see all of my resources there uh but really i think um like i said i really got into um self improvement self development and education early on and it was just because i i saw that what we were learning in school wasn't really applicable to real life you know apart from you know training for a profession or a skill or you know a job or occupation so it really didn't prepare you for the real world um from there there's a uh, I think the number one thing is to build a solid network. So um, you're always learning. You always have resources with people. You're always connecting with people, asking questions, um, you know, giving um, thoughtful answers and it's, and it's an exchange. So, and, and that's been a really good source because then you can uh, turn to different people with different opinions and ideas. Um, but really it, it takes a, it takes um, just, Self knowledge and education. You have to take that initiative. You know, invest one or two hours per day in your in learning something new outside of your field, and that'll take you a long way as well. Absolutely, one of the pieces of advice that we actually uh, hear from quite a bit that uh, from doctors and we give as well, and we encourage, we tell, promote to doctors is a better tomorrow starts tonight. So before you go to bed, you know, have a little notebook or a post-it pad or and make a list of the things you know you need to get done in the morning or you need to get done tomorrow. And maybe it's two things, maybe it's five things, and you just write them down with a little po you know, a little pen or a pencil next to your, your nightstand. And it's like, I got to get these things done. Make sure that starts tomorrow. It's the, the goal is not pro the goal is not perfection. The goal is progress and, uh -huh. you know, moving that needle forward. Like, you know what, I need to get that book. Uh, you know, this is a great time uh, being earlier in the year. You know, but any time is a good time. We find that September is the new January as well, you uh -huh. know, with school starting every year uh, in the fall that, you know, families are kind of hitting the reset button, almost going on diets to prepare for, you know, the holidays and they're entertaining uh -huh. and seeing loved ones. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's like, I'm going to buy some Audible books. I'm going to listen to some books. Uh, I'm going to start reading. I'm going to start going to these networking groups. 
Uh, and it's, it can be tough to know, you know, who to trust and what, what, which, which road to go down. Um, and so what would be a first couple of steps for physicians, uh, you know, listening health and, and, and again, this might not be just for physicians, you know, are you also seeing PAs, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, RNs, are you seeing them, you know, diversify, their, I guess you could say, portfolio, so to speak, of, of revenue, so that they also have uh, places to, to fall back on as well. Are you helping and seeing, uh, having those conversations? Mm. Um, one thing you mentioned what, that was interesting was so with nurse practitioners and PAs, I'm actually seeing a lot uh, more interest in, um, in terms of the, uh, the mid-levels the, and the, a number of individuals going into that field. And I think it's for a couple of reasons. One is because um, uh, one is that the, the time frame for education and training is much shorter. So they're getting out in, you know, before their thirties that have, you know, probably five to six really solid earning years so they can start investing that, that amount earlier. And then the other thing is just, I think just the amount of um, hours in the training and just, you know, the student loan debt and the stress with being a physician uh, is, um, is making people second guess or think of different careers or if there's different alternative, better ways to, to, um, to making an impact. So that's one thing, uh, you know, for the, for the general population, there's a great, um, quote where it just says, um, and you know, some people subscribe to it and some people don't, but it's, uh, you know, it's called hashtag live like a resident. And it's essentially, Mm -hmm. you know, regardless of how much money you make, if you keep your expenses low, you'll do that much better. So you don't, and you don't have to, you know, live, uh, you know, a very frugal lifestyle, but it's just where you're just very cost conscious about each and every expense. And so that way your um, expense doesn't, you know, creep up to um, uh, untackable levels. So our, our guest today is Dr. Christopher Liu. We're going to uh, put the links to your link tree, your websites, your emails, uh, so that those listening and watching can learn uh, and connect with you directly when they have questions about resources, books, uh, those types of things. Because uh, you know that is important. And, and one of the things that we I even heard you know in reference to you know for for the older demographic watching and listening and learning is. Uh, you know, I think it was Clark Howard. He's a consumer advisor. He's not a physician, but you think he's oh. a consumer advisor. Are you familiar with who he is? Uh, Cl- I know Clark it's- Howard. So I think it's Clark.com, but he was talking about the what's necessary for retirement. And I think he went with the 4% rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was just, you know, less than an hour or two ago on, on our Atlanta based radio and talking about, you know, let's look at how you can live off four percent of what you are currently uh you you will go through four percent of your savings uh or when you retire so you have no more lines of revenue coming in that you are going to eat up essentially four percent of what you have saved let's say you don't earn any more you don't earn one dollar more you will try to live off of that four percent not in a meager way, because hopefully you got, you know, hopefully you've done well in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and that also jumps on, and I'm, I know I'm kind of lily pad jumping here, but I also want to speak to the idea of, uh, and I think that this is something that when I've talked with medical professors who are teaching young residents, teaching uh, uh, the future of, of our medical care providers out there is, you know, why is it that and this is a tough question, and I know it might it might cause attention for some of those listening, and it might be like, thanks for asking that. Um, but I think we need your honest opinion on this one. Why is it that you know young folks in particular who are coming out of school, medical school, are taught that making no money as a healthcare provider, as a physician, is a badge of honor? I'm going to let you jump on that. That's a big, important, hairy bear you know, to talk about, because, you know, the benevolence and the giving spirit of a physician is incredible. I've met so many incredible physicians over the years and their hearts and their heartbeats to help people are so great, but then they're not rewarded for it. And I understand, you know, you're not going into medicine to, to make a ton of money, but you do have to live. 
And, you know, with the burnout increasing among a lot of provider sets, we got to do something. We got to incentivize doctors, nurses, PAs, et cetera, to come into these fields because without them, you know, our communities, the pandemic proved that our communities need them. So I'm going to let you tackle that one. I think um, I, I like that question and it's a good question and it's really important because I think um, our, the culture of medicine um, is still, like I said, medicine is a slow, very slow growing um, profession. So a lot of the cultural social norms. So back then, you know, you're expected to, you know, work 120 plus hours and, you know, never come home, never see your wife and kids, you know, and that was a badge of honor. And, you know, you're supposed to, you know, take abuse. And that was sort of, it's like a, it was a, almost like a hazing ritual in the process. And if you made it and once you made it, you know, then you could, um, you know, it was sort of a, a rite of passage. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's one part of it. I think the other part of it is that, um, like I said, uh, physicians, the culture is, uh, of medicine, you know, you're guilted and you're shamed for talking about money or speaking about money or, you know, asking for, um, payment for your services. And so that's in, instilled and ingrained couple with that, you, you don't have a, um, you have a lack of financial education and literacy among physicians and residents and within the institution. And then you're, this sets the stage up for what happened last year. So, and then on top of that, you have um, evolving paradigms. So you, you, you have a um, system that's changed from a very stable, simple um, industrial age paradigm into something that's highly complex, rapidly changing, um, highly variable, highly dynamic um, information age paradigm, and now you now you're you're set with um, with you know physicians just requiring different um, uh, different mindsets and skill sets. So uh, the um, I think some of the best skills for physicians to have today is um, one is the very sharp business mindset. And that's not only to protect them, but also to um, help them uh, prosper in their career. So, uh, on on top of that, a, a strong you know marketing skill set, a strong advertising, and a business skill set will help the physician survive, especially in terms of um, managing their personal finances, to managing their clinic, and to um, managing their um, their career. Third is the fact that you have a uh, in the information age, now the healthcare business model has changed. So, you know, right now insurance and these regulatory agencies control physicians, hospitals. And so really they're the ones calling the shots. So, and then, and then they, on top of that, they take advantage of the benevolence of physicians. And then what happens is that, um, you know, you have increased workload, you have increased burnout, you have decreased reimbursement, increasing malpractice, and that's why you're, that's a large part of why you're seeing a, a mass exodus of physicians currently. Wow. And our guest today is Dr. Christopher Liu, and we're coming in for a landing in our first part of this series. And so our final question for you, Dr. Liu, as we conclude the first part of this series and stay tuned for the second part of our series coming up with uh, Dr. Liu, we're going to talk about the mindsets and skill sets required um, to be successful outside of medicine Uh, but still keep one foot in the door and the factors affecting uh, exodus for a lot of different providers. Um, And so Dr. Chris Tiverlu, we're going to put all of your links above and below. uh, So please reach out to Dr. Liu. He is here for you, um, you know, and happy to, to, to help you and to talk with you. Um, You know, maybe you're just at a crossroads where you need another peer with an objective perspective to say, you know, here's my situation, call up Dr. Lou and be like, here's my situation. And I'm just not sure what to do. I've, I've got these, you know, investment properties and I just, I'm not happy with them or I want to get into something, but I don't know where to start or man, it, I can't do this anymore. And I got to do something. And I'm so glad I stumbled upon this. Uh, so uh, what do you want doctors to think, feel, and do uh, before our next series? Uh, well, I think the big takeaway um, from today's talk is 
is all about financial resiliency and financial fitness. So that all starts with um, with uh, just financial education. So you know, if I planted the seeds, you know, either you need to do something different or or start or um, you know find new resources. Uh, my main motivation today was to inspire, motivate, and or and to plant seeds for for your future financial pathway. Absolutely. And planting those seeds is such an important part of uh, taking the next steps and putting handles on what we've talked about here. Our guest today has been Dr. Christopher Liu. Uh, we're going to come in for our second part of our series. So please uh, stay tuned for that here in the next few hours or days. And uh, we're definitely want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise and what you're doing for doctors. We say a lot around here. It's not about being the best doctor in the world any longer. And that doesn't mean inside of the exam room. It doesn't mean inside of your clinical practice. It could also be out and about in your community, speaking from stage, writing an op-ed piece for your local newspaper. Yes, people still do read those and, or you know, blog, whatever. Uh, but it's about being the best doc, not about being the best doctor in the world any longer. It's about being the best doctor for the world, for your community. And if you have them, for your patients, and I'll add one more for your family and for yourself. So thanks, Dr. Christopher Liu. We look forward to catching up with you in part two. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate our time together. You want to change your practice. You want more patients. You want to leave an office environment at the end of the day feeling like this is a really great place to work. It's a place that they want to come back to again and again. So here at Concierge Medicine Today and the Concierge Medicine Forum, we're bringing you a new course called a Masterclass in Interior Design. We're going to talk with two healthcare interior designers who understand the psychology of furnishing and paint color and design and the hard work that goes into creating an irresistible healthcare environment. And yes, it is possible on a limited budget too. Go to fourdoctorsforum.org or concierge medicine. Team. When the world breaks, you stand tall when you feel pain.